Major funding for American Experience is provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. National corporate funding is provided by Liberty Mutual and the Scotts Company. American Experience is also made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. This concrete jungle. There ain't many places where there's sand. And there certainly ain't a lot of places where there's water. And you combine water with sand, and lo and behold, you got a beach. See that? The guy who invented that? That was marvelous. Albert Einstein created the general theory of relativity and talked about this thing called gravity and Coney Island dismissed it entirely. <laughs> I saw this wonderful machine where people riding on it and taking all kinds of curves and I saw this as a work of art like it was a modern something modern out of a, someone invented this thing. To me it was a mobile. I felt thrilled by it. It was the nature of going to Coney Island that you would encounter strangeness. You would encounter the unencounterable. I don't know if you remember the symbol of steeplechase. You know, it's a clown with an egg smile like that there, laughing. George C. Pillow steeplechase. A leering grin. Steeplechase. Come have fun and other things. <laughs> it is blatant. It is cheap. It is the apotheosis of the ridiculous. But it is something more. It is like Niagara Falls, or the Grand Canyon, or Yellowstone Park. It is a national playground. And not to have seen it is not to have seen your own country. Play is not a luxury, one reformer wrote at the turn of the century, but an absolute necessity to the working world of today. By 1895, a spit of land at the foot of Brooklyn had become the most extravagant playground in the country. And the summer safety valve for the most explosively packed metropolis on earth. But Coney Island was more than a playground. 
The three great amusement parks that flourished there turned the machines of industry into instruments of play and let loose the bright forces and dark possibilities of a vast democratic culture. Coney Island astonished, delighted, and appalled the nation and took America from the Victorian age into the modern world. In 1905, the entire Western world knew what Coney was. They knew that if you wanted to be really excited, to have a really good time, to have something that your people back home would want to hear about, you went to Coney Island. This place, in its time, both fascinated people and scared them to death. Coney Island offered the future in little ways, but in the first tangible ways these people were able to touch, in tiny ways, in toys. The 20th century was coming in at Coney Island. On September 1st, 1609, one day before he discovered Manhattan, Henry Hudson discovered Coney Island, a five-mile-long waste of sand dunes, scrub grass, and conies, the wild rabbits that gave the place its name. Coney was still a wasteland two centuries later, when in 1847, a side-wheeler from Manhattan began tying up at a makeshift pier on the island's western end. Out on the beach, men served clams and beer under a crude pavilion. Amidst raucous bouts of three-card monte and a dice game called chocolate. It is a well-known fact, one visitor complained, that picnics are often arranged for the sole benefit of pickpockets, prostitutes, and swindlers. Dead bodies were sometimes found rolling in the surf. At the eastern end of the island, as far as possible from the disorder of the west, three vast frame hotels went up. By the 1870s, the Brighton Beach, the Manhattan Beach, and the Oriental Hotels were drawing respectable families and their servants for the whole summer. The proprietors piped in fresh water from the mainland, offered band concerts every evening, and paid detectives to patrol the beaches where the guests were mastering the difficult art of sea bathing. People too poor for the east end of the island and too cautious for the west spilled out along a mongrel stretch of beach called West Brighton that was not yet built up by the big developers. What crowds of people, light-hearted, laughing people, rich, poor, citified, country-clad, all sorts, all thrilled by the tonic of the atmosphere, and all active, yet wondering at their activity. By 1875, an Irish-born builder named John Y. McCain had wrested control of Coney's political machinery so completely that no building from a chowder stand to an iron pier went up without his approval. During McCain's reign, the island became a showcase for the wonders of the machine age. In 1876, the centerpiece of the Philadelphia Exposition was moved to Coney an observation tower whose steam-powered elevators lifted people 300 feet above the sea. It was the tallest structure in the United States. After descending from the tower, sightseers could refresh themselves from the mechanical udders of an inexhaustible cow.
Daring bathers could go for nighttime swims, pulling themselves along ropes under the hissing blaze of primitive arc lamps. People called it electric bathing. Afterward, they could eat a novel kind of hot, fast food. Its inventor, Charles Feltman, called them Coney Island Red Hots. Others, uncertain of their ingredients, called them hot dogs. In 1884, Lamarcus Thompson invented a gravity-powered ride he called a switchback railway. The roller coaster was born. Before long, there were refinements the loop-the-loop, -loop and the flip-flap railway. The flip-flap could take only four passengers at a time, frequently damaged them, and soon went out of business. A new structure now dominated the Coney Island skyline, a hotel in the shape of an elephant, tin-skinned and 122 feet high, a cigar store in one lane, a diorama in another, and rooms available in the hip, shoulder, cheek, trunk, and thigh. Coney Island, our popular summer resort, has been a suburb of Sodom. Indeed, Sodom bore no comparison to this place for vileness. One cannot speak in public of the scenes which are daily enacted at that resort, and by which young people of both sexes are polluted. Reverend A.C. Dixon, the New York Times. Houses of prostitution are a necessity on Coney Island, and I don't propose to interfere with the gambling at Brighton Beach and Sheepshead Bay. After all, this ain't no Sunday school. John Y. McCain. By 1893, McCain had become an impediment to the island's growth. The New York Times declared that Coney Island had become Sodom by the sea, and worried that its reputation would keep people away. That year, to keep a reformed candidate out of office, Boss McCain registered 6,218 voters, 5,000 more than Coney's entire eligible voting population. And on election day, had his police beat and jail the state officials sent to keep him from rigging the polls. It was the boss's last victory. Two months later, McCain was on trial for election fraud, contempt of court, misuse of public funds, and nine other charges. With Mr. McCain now in Sing Sing, it remains to be seen how far the keepers of the resorts can make their places attractive without vice. The experiment will be interesting. Every nation needs escape from respectability, from the world of what we have to do into the world of what we would like to do, from the world of duty that endureth forever into the world of joy that is permitted for a moment. Perhaps Coney Island is the most human thing that God ever made. Or permitted the devil to make. By the last decade of the 19th century, there were more than three million New Yorkers. A million and a half of them lived in slums, more closely herded than the people of Calcutta or Bombay. Coney Island exploded. A quarter of a million people could be found there on summer Sundays. Thomas Edison's incandescent light began burning across the island. Soon, the aurora of three great amusement parks 
would be visible 30 miles out to sea. In 1896, the motion picture camera was perfected. Among the first titles the Edison Company offered its exhibitors that summer were Sea Waves at Coney Island and Cakewalk on the Beach. Youth is extravagant to prodigality with itself. It is drunk with its own passionate, intoxicating perfume. And we surround that young, passionate, bursting blossom with every temptation to break down its resistant power. Lure it into sentiment, pulsating desire, and eroticism. By lurid literature, moving pictures, tango dances, suggestive songs, cabaret, noise, until the senses are throbbing with leashed in physical passion. People are always scared by change, and Coney represented change of a particularly powerful and picturesque kind. If you go to a place that's only a streetcar ride away, where the rules of behavior are entirely changed, even the people who are enjoying it are going to realize that something strong and transforming is happening to them. They're, they're, going to, uh, they're going to be made nervous by the very things that give them pleasure. If Paris is France, Coney Island between June and September is the world. George C. Tillieu. The man who succeeded McCain as Coney's ruler was not a politician. He was a showman, but different from any showman who had come before him. His name was George C. Tillieu, and he was the first impresario of controlled chaos. In 1893, the 26-year-old Coney Islander visited the Chicago World's Fair and tried to buy George Ferris's 250-foot-tall wheel on the spot. He failed, went home to Coney, and ordered a wheel half the size, then put up a sign that said, on this site will be erected the world's largest Ferris wheel. By the time the machine arrived, Tillieu had rented out enough concession space to pay for it. Tillieu's main competitor was Captain Paul Boyton, who had spent most of his life on the rivers of the world, paddling himself to international fame in an inflatable rubber suit. At Coney, he opened Sea Lion Park, a ramshackle cluster of attractions featuring a boat ride down a chute the chutes. As soon as he saw it, Tillieu wanted a park of his own, but he needed an attraction to rival Boyton's chutes. He found it in England, a mechanical horse race, and began laying out the sinuous iron track of his steeplechase ride. In 1897, Steeplechase Park opened its doors for the first time. The young men like it because it gives them a chance to hug the girls. The girls like it because it gives them a chance to get hugged. Everybody likes it because it is cheap fun, real fun, lively fun. It realizes its motto, half a mile in half a minute, and fun all the time. The horses were only part of the fun. Dismounting from the steeplechase ride, Customers had to cross a small, bright stage, ruled by a clown and a dwarf. It was called the Blowhole Theater. It played for almost 70 years, New York's longest running show. As a couple stepped onto the stage, a jet of air blew the woman's skirt up around her waist. 
while the dwarf gleefully shocked her date with an electric cattle prod. The audience shrieked with laughter and waited for the next victim, while the latest ones took their seats in the crowd. Sometimes the manager had to darken the stage and empty the theater so a new audience could push in. Tidu had discovered that customers would pay for the privilege of entertaining other customers, that people liked seeing shows, but they liked seeing people more. He had also discovered that men and women liked almost anything that allowed them to grab hold of each other. The attractions inside Steeplechase soon included the earthquake float, the skating floor, the falling statue, the human cage, the revolving seat, the funny stairway, the eccentric fountain, the dancing floor, the electric seat, the human roulette wheel. Time was when the place was shunned by ultra-respectable New Yorkers who went instead to Manhattan Beach but nowadays, Coney is visited by all classes. When you bathe in Coney, you bathe in the American Jordan. It is holy water. Nowhere else in the United States will you see so many races mingle in a common purpose for a common good. Democracy meets here and has its first interview, skin to skin. Here you find the real interpretation of the Declaration of Independence, the most good for the greatest number. Tolerance. Freedom. On July 28, 1907, fire broke out at Steeplechase in the Cave of the Winds. The big wooden park burned for 18 hours. The next day, Tillieu had a sign up where the entrance had been. To inquiring friends, I have troubles today that I did not have yesterday. I had troubles yesterday that I have not today. On this site will be erected shortly a better, bigger, greater steeplechase park. Admission to the burning ruins Ten cents. Nine months later, the park was open again. This time, Tillieu covered everything with a glass and steel shed and called it the Pavilion of Fun. It made Steeplechase impervious to the weather. Tillieu's rivals claimed he went to church to pray for rain. And there were some rivals now. Frederick Thompson, was a failed architect with a drinking problem who had dropped out from the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. Elmer Skip Dundee was a court clerk from Omaha who had once managed to sell the bankrupt Union Pacific Railroad for more than $90 million. Across Surf Avenue from Steeplechase, the two men were building the most extraordinary amusement park on earth. Their partnership began at the 1901 Buffalo Exposition with an elaborate attraction called A Trip to the Moon. He got into a big winged thing that looked like a modern airplane and you felt like you were traveling up to the sky. And when you got out, you met a lot of midgets dressed up like the people in the moon. The whole thing was mysterious and spooky and made your gal hold on to you. Thompson and Dundee's moon ride was the sensation of the fair. So successful that George Tillieu asked them to bring it to Steeplechase Park. When Tillieu demanded a larger share of the profits, Thompson and Dundee refused and set out to build their own park. Declaring that straight lines are necessarily severe and dead, Thompson banished them from his drafting table. In building for a festive occasion, 
There should be an absolute departure from all set forms of architecture. One must dare to decorate a minaret with Renaissance detail. Or to jumble Romanesque with Art Nouveau. Always with the idea of keeping his line constantly varied, broken and moving. First step is to get emotional excitement into the very air. They named their park Luna, not for the moon, as some thought, but for Skip's sister Luna, over in Bayonne, New Jersey. By opening night, Thompson and Dundee had only $11 left between them and had to comb the island to come up with change for the ticket takers. At 8 o'clock on the evening of May 16th, 1903, the gates opened. About 45,000 men, women and children strolling along Surf Avenue stopped and rubbed their eyes and stood in wonder and pinched themselves to see if there was not something wrong somewhere. Nobody had ever seen anything like it. Thompson and Dundee had decorated their forest of towers and minarets with 250,000 incandescent lights. It was, one man said, an electric Eden. Here is alchemy. Here in full view of thousands, in tiers of boxes and promenades. The spotted horses, the clowns, the acrobats, jugglers, hoop artists, intellectual elephants, Arabian pyramidists, tumblers, contortionists, disport under the crackling lashes of the ringmaster. You felt you were in the Orient, you felt you were in different parts of the world. And the buildings itself, made you feel that you were a great chieftain. And these were your temples, and you could go in there just for a nickel. You could become a, a chieftain yourself. You could be almost anything you wanted. All the fairy tales that you read as a little boy were coming true right here in Luna Park. It was heaven. You went down this thing at this unbelievable speed and you hit the water, and you got covered with the spray, and everyone was shouting, and then you would go across this wonderful lagoon with little lights around the edge. It was just fantastic. Ah, God, said one visitor, what might the prophet have written in Revelation if only he had first beheld a spectacle like this? Thompson and Dundee made a formidable team. In just six weeks, they had paid back every cent of the $700,000 it had cost to build Luna Park. By season's end, they were rich men. Luna's success fascinated William H. Reynolds, a New York politician with a reputation for brokering shady real estate deals. Reynolds talked the city of New York into selling him 60 acres between Surf Avenue and the sea, then got them to throw in West 8th Street for free. Reynolds planned to build a park to end all parks. It would hold 250,000 people at a time. Its one million electric lights would dazzle Luna into obscurity. It would be another world. A dream world. He called it Dreamland. All through the first winter of Luna's success, tall white towers rose across the street.
the most dramatic thing that happened in Coney Island was Dreamland itself. You felt that you were being elevated into another class, into a, a higher position in life. It was a more cultural thing. It was a more graceful thing. Reynolds built his park on a colossal scale. It was to be a catalog of the future, an inventory of the strange, and a compendium of the century to come. The newest technology, the latest science, the odd, the bizarre, the far-flung, would be at home in dreamland. The park was spread beneath a 375-foot beacon tower. At night, its imperial searchlight beamed 50 miles out over the Atlantic, disorienting ships on their way into New York Harbor. Beneath it, gondolas drifted through the canals of Venice. Trains carried patrons through the Swiss Alps, where they were cooled by blasts of refrigerated mountain air. There was a train of the future. The wreck-proof leapfrog railway allowed two trains to pass each other without mishap on the same track. Human beings from every part of the globe were brought to dreamland and put on display. The park manager, Sam Gumperts, acquired a dozen Somali warriors from French Equatorial Africa and an entire village of Eskimos. In 1905, he hustled 51 Igorot tribesmen from the Philippines past startled immigration officials. Gumperts himself recruited all the citizens of Lilliputia, a half-scale European village which served as year-round home to 300 midgets. At creation, visitors journeyed backward through 60 centuries of biblical history to the divine origin of all things. Next door, vast panoramic exhibits foreshadowed the end of the world and hell. Here is a young girl who has bought herself a new hat and is contentedly admiring herself in the mirror. A couple of small and apparently very hungry devils steal up to her from behind and seize her by the arm. She cries out, but too late. The devils lay her in a long, smooth chute Tongues of red paper flame rise up and down the chute into the pit slides the girl, the mirror, and the hat. For a public fascinated with horrors closer to home, there was fire and flames, a gigantic stage disaster, where scores of firemen battle the flames engulfing a block of asbestos-covered tenement buildings twice a day. The infant incubator forms one of the most interesting and thoroughly scientific features of Dreamland. Think of a family of incubated children, each baby in its own castle, and each receiving royal care these delicate, frail, tiny cherubs are not yet ready to begin the struggle for existence. The most popular exhibit at Dreamland was the infant incubator. Dr. Martin Cooney knew more about premature babies than anyone else in the world, but he was unable to persuade hospitals to adopt his techniques, and in 1904 set up shop at Dreamland. 
Of 8,000 infants brought to Dr. Cooney over the years, 7,500 survived. Beyond Dreamland's white ramparts, Coney Island seethed with recreated disasters and historical spectacles. 600 veterans of the Boer War, fresh from Johannesburg, refought their battles in a 12,000-seat stadium. Galveston disappeared beneath the flood. Mount Pele erupted hourly, while across the street, Mount Vesuvius showered death on the people of Pompeii. Crowds surged through the dance halls and restaurants and saloons along the Bowery. 450 motion pictures ran simultaneously, night and day. Many of the shows featured the spectacles of Coney itself. <laughs> On a single day in September 1906, 200,000 postcards were mailed from Coney Island. Coney Island was a kind of magazine of life. Except instead of reading about it and seeing color pictures, you could experience it, you could participate in it. Girly shows, premature babies on display, trips on these crazy rides. This was a great acculturating experience, acculturating you to the nature of life. Life was not a simple, pure, dainty, demure thing. Life was unpredictable, life was confusing, life wasn't fair, and it all happened to you. And there was no morality that said you had to be this way, you had to be that way. It was a perpetual circus. It had everything that Barnum could dream of and more. If you want to get a sense of the temper of the nation at the time Coney was at its peak, you could not do better than to go to Thompson and Dundee's Naval Spectatorium in Luna Park, where for 25 cents you could see a show that had in its entirety the navies of the world, Japan, Portugal, Germany, coming in and shelling Manhattan and Admiral Dewey's fleet steaming out and sinking every one of them. When it was at its most popular, it most perfectly reflected its culture. And, you know, part of that was it showed people what they wanted to see or what they wanted to think their country was going to become. And, and I think part of that was just the excitement of electricity. Dreamland never became as popular as Luna or Steeplechase. But its cascade of lights completed a skyline unlike anything else in the world. Coney was more than three big amusement parks. It was a city. The newspapers called it the City of Fire. With the advent of night, a phantom city of fire rears itself skyward from the ocean. Thousands of glowing sparks glimmer in the darkness Threads of golden gossamer tremble in the air, weave translucent patterns of fire, hang motionless, in love with the beauty of their own reflection in the water. Fabulous beyond conceiving, ineffably beautiful, is this fiery scintillation. Maxim Gorky. While Sigmund Freud was formulating the pleasure principle in theory across the Atlantic, Tillieu, Thompson, Dundee and Reynolds 
were perfecting it in fact on Coney Island, which for a brief moment became the realized unconscious of its age. Much of what people found there scared them, but they came. Everybody came to Coney sooner or later. On a warm September night in 1909, Sigmund Freud himself could be found at Coney Island, contemplating dreamland. The brazen voice of the island begins to beat upon the eardrums like the pulse of fever. The leaping horses and the flying cars are metamorphosed into the agile demons of delirium. And through the doorways of endless concert halls and drinking places, one glimpses faces that follow and haunt like the unspeakable phantoms of a dream. Thompson and Dundee's private herd of elephants roamed through Luna Park. One of their favorites, Topsy, had even helped build Luna. But she had a bad temper. She killed three men in three years, one of whom had fed her a lighted cigarette. It was clear that Topsy had to go. When she shrugged off the effects of two carrots fortified with 400 grains of potassium cyanide, Thompson and Dundee saw a chance for publicity and announced she would be hanged. When the ASPCA protested, the partners came up with a new plan. Coney's powerful electrical plant could do more than light a park. And now Thomas Edison's men came over to Coney from New Jersey and set up two huge electrodes. Dundee and some handlers led Topsy to the platform. When she balked, they offered her keeper $25 to help, but he refused to take part in the murder of his six-ton charge. Finally, they got the elephant hooked up, electrodes on the right forefoot and the left rear, and through the switch. It took 10 seconds. There was no noise. The sun is set, and the world is become suddenly a fire. The view of Luna Park from Sheep's Head Bay suggests a cemetery of fire. The tombs, turrets, and towers illuminated, and mortuary shafts of flame. Fire is the god of Coney Island after sundown. And fire was its god this night, the hottest of the summer. May 27th, 1911, was opening day of the season. At two o'clock in the morning, workmen were still busy at Hellgate in Dreamland when the circuitry started acting up. Light bulbs burst. Someone knocked over a bucket of hot tar and it caught fire. In minutes, Hellgate was ablaze. Nearby fire companies got there right away, but everything was lath and plaster, wood and tar and paint. Half an hour after the first alarm, the Dreamland Tower was a column of fire, so tall and bright it could be seen in Manhattan. 
Animals from Vostok Circus ran panicked and burning out onto Surf Avenue. At three o'clock, the Dreamland Tower collapsed. L.A. Thompson's Old Scenic Railway disappeared, and the Great Whirlwind Coaster, and finally the old Centennial Observation Tower itself shuddered and fell. 33 fire companies had gotten to the scene, but it was a change in the wind that saved what was left of Coney. At dawn, the firemen packed up and went home. It would have been a perfect opening day, warm, still, and cloudless. Fred Thompson found Dreamland's manager, Sam Gumperts, staring at acres of smoking rubble and wordlessly shook his hand. All that was left of Dreamland was the pretty waltz that had been written to celebrate its opening just seven seasons earlier. There was talk of rebuilding Dreamland, but it never happened. Two years later, George C. Tillieu died. Fred Thompson went bankrupt and lost Luna Park. World War I came. The public fascination with recreated disasters declined. Down here at Coney Island, toward the end of the season, I am made to feel very sad. The mammoth empty buildings, planned by extraordinarily optimistic architects, remind me in an unpleasant manner of my youthful dreams. There is a mighty pathos in these gaunt and hollow buildings, impassively and stolidly suffering from an enormous hunger for the public. Stephen Crane. Ready! The burning of Dreamland came very close on the burning of the world. It took people a while to realize that they hadn't just lost a park, that something had changed, that Coney wasn't going to go forward, all is getting grander. The country had changed, the world had changed. We'd been in an international war, we were an international power, we were an entirely industrialized society. The wonderful magnet that Coney had been simply wasn't needed any longer. Now, Coney did not get smaller. Coney got bigger and more populated. The subway lines got there. You get 300,000 people on a great day in 1913. You'd get a million on a great day in 1923. But it was a different place. It was no longer Coney Island. 
in the way that Coney Island fell on the ear of the whole world and represented something unique and entirely new. The island's pioneer days were over. But to the millions who worked and lived and came there, Coney would always be what it had been to George Tillyou, the world. have to be crazy to be shot out of a cannon? Sometimes. It helps, huh? Yes. I don't care for retail where they wear a pair. Everyone went to Coney Island. It was a nickel. Everything was a nickel. The subway was a nickel. The Frankfurter was a nickel. The rides were in nickel increments. Coney Island in the summer when I wanna swim. Walking with my Brooklyn baby when the lights are still. In Brooklyn, in Brooklyn, USA. I worked all through Coney Island. And I worked the games, I worked the rides, I was a barker. I worked the bird cage, you know what I mean? He, I stepped right up, stepped right up for the young lady. Huh? Wouldn't you like that plush teddy bear? Oh, look at the eyes on that young lady. Oh, she's practically weeping. It's very easy for you. Look at the strong arm that kid has got. My guy's liable to knock them all down with one ball. I'll be a loser. Step right up. Go right ahead, son. I mean, you had to live whatever, you know. Freddie's father ran the Thunderbolt roller coaster. And when Freddie's father died, Freddie took over. He had a record player. He used to play the records. And uh, we drink brandy, um, Remy Martin's brandy, and hot dogs from Nathan's. That went on for 40 years under the roller coaster. We used to find teeth in the yard. We used to find wigs, glasses, guns, everything we found in the yard. Nobody ever came back for them now. Hurry, hurry, step this way, the strangest sights on the island. Freaks from the four corners of the world. It's just starting. So hurry, hurry, look them over, the lady without a head. There are thin ones, there are fat ones. They're all inside. Oh, there was uh, Jojo, the dog-faced boy, with the hair on his face, you know, genetic mutation. Uh, we had the Georgia Peach, uh, the people with the heads that come to a point. And we had uh, Annie the Alligator. Those are people who have ichthyosis, you know, the scaly skin you know, all over their body. Of course, the bearded lady, I work with a lot of those. And George was one of those guys who could throw his eyes out of his head about that distance, like that. He could throw either both of them or one or the other out. And uh, I had a great reunion with him. I hadn't seen him in maybe 30 years. He was close to 70 then, George, and still doing the same thing. The depression rolled over Coney. The prizes in the game booths changed from Cupid dolls and bamboo canes to sugar, coffee, and crackers. At Luna Park, the scale of the shows dwindled. Pigs replaced elephants on the water slides. And by the end of the 30s, there were cockroach races at Coney. It would seem that a community which calls itself civilized 
might do a little more by way of recreation for its citizens between the tight spaces of the cradle and the grave. Certainly, there is no reason to perpetuate out of doors the overcrowding of our tenements. New York City Parks Commissioner Robert Moses hated Coney's noise and squalor and yearned to transform the island into serene parkland. Just before the Second World War, he launched a series of assaults on the sideshows to clean the place up. The concessionaires fought him. He did shut down the ballyhoo in front of the sideshows, but he could not kill the shows themselves. Those people who criticized it could afford to go to the Riviera. And uh, they hated the fact that millions of poor people were having a good time. And uh, in all the years that, that I was associated with, either working or, or as a visitor, I never saw any depravity any more than uh, I would see in the lobby of the Waldorf Astoria. Coast to coast, the thermometer blows its top, and one out of every 100 Americans beats the heat at Coney Island, the poor man's Riviera, a national institution. From New York's tenements and from every state in the Union they come, and keep coming. How many people? Ask Monroe Ehrman, crowd counter extraordinary. It's his business. For 38 years, he's counted noses, toeses, and people with very few closes. 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, monotonous? Never. For in this herd of humanity, there's a privacy all its own. Love like this will never admit defeat. Coney Island's biggest day came shortly after the war. On Friday, July 4th, 1940. Coney Island didn't care. They didn't care where you were from, what degrees you had, what your background was. You all went into the same water. That's what's important about a city. It's the art that, that comes out of the city. It's the fervor. It's the people. It's what they compose, what they paint, what they create. That's what, what's, what lasts. That's what's important. And Coney Island represented that. Each group of people came and expressed themselves in the water of Coney Island and on the sands. Our area was all Italian. And uh, the families brought their instruments also, the guitars, the mandolin. So there'd be groups playing the old Italian songs, the new uh, American songs, the ch children danced. We used to sing the, the song about the sailor, and the, he's just happy being at sea uh, with his net, getting the fish, and his girlfriend is next to him, and life was simple and beautiful, the boat, the sea, and his girl, and the fish. <laughs>
Suddenly I am at the seashore and no recollection of the train stopping. Everything is sordid, shoddy, thin as pasteboard, a Coney Island of the mind. The amusement shacks are running full blast, the shelves full of chinaware and dolls stuffed with straw and alarm clocks and spittoons. Over it all, in a muffled roar, comes the steady hiss and boom of the breakers. Behind the pasteboard street front, the breakers are plowing up the night with luminous argent teeth. In the oceanic night, steeplechase looks like a wintry beard. Everything is sliding and crumbling Everything glitters, totters, teeters, titters. Everything is a lie, a fake, pasteboard. Everything is made of nuts and bolts. The monarch of the mind is a monkey wrench. Sovereign, pasteboard, power. Henry Miller. In the end, the world that Coney Island ushered in overtook it. The towers of Luna Park were just as tall and just as bright. But Manhattan's grew taller and eventually outshone them. Coney's mechanical diversions were being superseded by the automobile. Immigrant parents who had saved up all year to spend one day at Coney grew old. Many of their children prospered and moved to the suburbs. In 1944, fire struck the island again, ripping through Luna Park and gutting all but a few rides. The park limped on for a couple of seasons, then closed forever in 1946. Of the great parks, only steeplechase kept going. On through the 40s, on through the 50s, and into the 60s. Then, on the night of September 20th, 1964, while Old Lang Syne, and there's no business like show business, played out over the public address system, a bell chimed once for each of the 67 years Steeplechase Park had been in business. The lights went off tier by tier, blazed out one last time. Then Steeplechase went dark. When Steeplechase closed, yeah, that was terrible. It's also sad. Uh, because we kind of knew that it was a demise and it wasn't going to be rebuilt. That era was gone. When a certain part of your life disappears and is no more, and you know deep down it's gone, it's sad. Hey, because what is no more is not just Coney Island, but a part of me is no more. When land and water meet, wonderful things always happen. 
That means to me that Coney Island will forever be an opportunity. And I don't think that what Coney Island should be in people's minds is let's bring back what was, but rather let's consider it a frontier to do the thing of the future. Because that intersection of sand and waves, the kind of light that you have, all evoke very powerful, primitive, creative urges in people, in all people, not just artists, not just developers, but somehow all people coming together. And they continue to come together, even though the cyclone is starting to show some age and the wonder wheel is creaking a little bit more slowly. But tomorrow will be different, and, and I hope, I deeply believe, that Coney Island will provide the opportunity to do a special thing there, as it was a special thing for a number of generations already. I'd like to have Saturday and Sunday working again in Coney Island. Barking the roller coaster or the rides or the games. To me, that was a challenge. It was a challenge. I had to say to myself, I got to get a crowd. It's a challenge. I'm going to get 25. This game. You think you're not, but just stay a little while. I got the hook just for that fish, kiddo. I got the hook. Let me tell you something. I hear friends of mine in show business, and they tell me about, gee, I worked in Akron, Ohio, or I worked in St. Louis, and what a tough audience. They don't know what a tough audience is. How can it be a tough audience when you are in a theater? I've never heard of a single human being who buys a ticket, he and his wife, to go to the theater and they say to themselves before they walk into the theater, I'm going to hate this here. Nobody says that. But I've got to get 25, 30, 40, 50 people who don't know what I'm about. And I have to extract. 50 cents from them. That's a tough audience. That's a tough audience. You go and try to sell those people. What are you, a con man or something they're thinking? What's the gimmick here, man? What's the scam? I don't like the way this guy looks. Look at those beady eyes on him. What kind of a slimy game is he running? Well, in spite of what they say, I'm going to get their quarter. I'm going to get their quarter. Major funding for American Experience is provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. National corporate funding is provided by Liberty Mutual and the Scotts Company. American Experience is also made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. <laughs>